And next, we are going to hear updates in medical oncology, and I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Joshua Savari, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine here at Perlmutter Cancer Center. Great. Again, my name is Josh Savari. I'm one of the medical oncologists in the Thoracic Oncology Group, and it's a real pleasure to uh, be here, and thanks for inviting me uh, uh, to this talk. So before I get started, uh, if someone, you know, with the show, raise of hands, uh, uh, who's been diagnosed with the lung cancer or knows somebody who has a lung cancer? in the room. Okay, so quite a bit of you here uh, in the room. And who has been a patient here at NYU? Okay, all right. So what I hope to do today is uh, go over lots of information, uh, and I really like it to be as interactive as possible. So I'm actually gonna call on people just to get your opinions, not individual people, but you know, just to see what your thoughts are. So what we'll talk about is lung cancer screening briefly, and Dr. Michaud went over this already, but this is probably one of the most important things you're going to hear today, and one of the most important things you're going to take back to your family and friends, because if we can A, prevent this or detect it early, uh, we're, we're going to be in better shape. I'll next talk about how to treat lung cancers, and this is a really complex uh, uh, sort of field right now, but I want to give everyone here a lot of hope. Uh, we've had a lot of new discoveries in the last few years, and I want to run through some of those with you. I'll talk a little bit about our portfolio here, of clinical trials, and that's how we develop new drugs, testing new drugs to lead to new treatments uh, to allow people to live longer and have better quality of life. And then lastly, I'll end with a, a new area or a new field of liquid biopsy of how to better understand the heterogeneity or how different cancer is in different places of the body. So lung cancer screening, and again, we heard a little bit about this already. So again, early detection saves lives. So here at NYU, we pioneered the use of CAT scans back in the 1990s for the early detection of lung cancer. And then since 2000, our lung cancer screening program here has been part of a uh, National Cancer Institute uh, funded uh, screening uh, detection research network. And we've had 1,700 people to date have participated in our biomarker screening program here. And Dr. Gaetan already discussed this, that there was a national lung cancer screening trial here, uh, here and other institutions that showed a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality. So what is this lung cancer screening that we all talk about? What, what actually happens? Has anyone had this? So what do they do? Yeah, so it's a simple CAT scan. It's a low dose radiation CAT scan where you have a discussion with your phys thank you. We ha you have a discussion with your physician and then you get a CAT scan that takes about 25 to 30 minutes and then you discuss the results with your physician in the office. And this intervention alone has led to a 20% reduction in mortality. So who should be screened? And this is the really important slide here for everybody with family members or anybody uh, who they know of. Anyone who's age 55 to 77 years old, and some guidelines even reach out to about 80 years old, who's smoked uh, within the last 15 years or currently smokes and who's willing to quit, right? If somebody's not willing to quit, screening doesn't make the most sense cost effectively. And again, they had to have about a 30 pack year history. So that could be two packs a day, for 15 years equal to 30, or one pack a day for 30 years. So any of your family, friends, loved ones who fits within this category, please urge them uh, to get a screening uh, CAT scan of the chest. And again, this is a simple procedure. Uh, it's actually pretty cheap. Uh, the amount of rate, and it's all covered by everyone's insurance, the amount of radiation is low, right? So, but, but still significant in the sense that we wanna make sure that we're benefiting people so they fit into these categories here. So we have a lung cancer screening program here. Dr. Michaud is the director of the program. It's one of the larger ones in New York, uh, and this is uh, sort of the plug uh, for the program. And I don't know if you guys know Dr. Uh, um, uh, Abe Chichua, uh, Dr. Chichua, uh, who would, you know, if he was your doctor here and you were diagnosed with a lung nodule, he would sit down with you and go over with this in the clinic. And I really want to take away any of the sort of fear and stigma this is a screening test just like a colonoscopy is a screening test or a pap smear is a screening test or a mammogram is a screening test. This is a critical piece that you should discuss with your primary care doctors, your uh, pulmonologist, uh, and anybody else who you come into contact with in medical care. So let's move to treatment. And this is uh, sort of the uh, exciting area in medical oncology, especially in lung cancers. Um, so what are some of the factors of why we decide to treat somebody with lung cancer or why, you know, what, what, anyone, anyone know about any of these factors that we think of when thinking about how to treat a lung cancer? I'll open it up to the crowd. Get to know first off, the 
Good, so we want to understand the cancer. What makes that cancer tick? And we talk about that as genetic mutations or abnormalities. So the lung cancer in somebody who is 45 and never smoked versus the lung cancer in somebody who's 85 years old and smoked 40 packs a year may be different, right? There may be different genetics in those different cancers. Any other, any other factors that you think about when, or, or you can bring up that we think about in treating lung cancer? So genetics is critically important. Christina, I didn't ask you to ask, but it was a planted question. Go for it. Good. So stage is critical. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about stage. Has anyone heard that word before? Stage. Yeah. So what does that mean? Size. So everybody is right. So size. Good. So, so the, the key here is where did the cancer start and where has the cancer gone? And that's critically important. Because if we identify cancers early, hence the screening program, if we identify cancers early, right, if they're located only in the lung area, we can then think about having a patient seen by a surgeon to have the cancer simply removed or surgically resected. And the cure rate, the, the, the cure rate in surgically resecting an early stage lung cancer is high. It's about 75%. So the earlier we can identify these abnormalities, the better people do. So what is a stage four lung cancer? Yes. Yes. Good. So a stage, a stage four lung cancer, again, is a cancer that starts in the lung and learns how to spread to other parts of the body. And in someone who's diagnosed with a stage four lung cancer, really the role for surgery is limited. And we really talk about systemic treatments or treatments that are able to go all over the body. Now, how about stage two and stage three? Those are sort of in the middle. Anyone know? Has anyone had a stage two or a stage three cancer? Stage three A. Stage 3A. So what, what was that? Well, for me, this is going back 21 years. I'm Jewish patient, so sure. I'm okay. Uh, they were going to do surgery first, but they couldn't because the tumor was too close to the chest wall. So after surgery, they were going to do it until Trump. So I had chemo, and I had surgery. And then I had radiation, which I didn't know was needed. So, so, so three, stage three cancer or stage two cancers are cancers that start in the lung and learn how to travel to lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are areas that actually help fight infection. And Dr. Michaud already talked a little bit about how important it is to sample the lymph nodes to better understand where has the cancer gone in the body. So correct, with a stage three cancer, we generally can treat with either chemotherapy and radiation followed by surgery or uh, with surgery followed by chemotherapy. That's sort of a more dicey field. But the key thing that I want to get across to everybody in the room today is that if we identify these early, right, we can do surgery alone. And if we identify them later, we need to do systemic treatments or treatments that can go all over the body. And not every one cancer or not all cancers are not the same. Everybody sort of has a different cancer, whether it's the stage or like you had mentioned, whether it's the genetics of the cancer. And that's critically important when we're thinking about the treatment. So we talked briefly already about stage. So stage one, we said, is just identified in one area of the lung. And again, that can be surgically resected. A stage three cancer, like you had mentioned, already learned how to spread to the lymph nodes, generally in the center part of the chest. And a stage four cancer is a cancer that learns how to spread to other parts of the body, usually through the bloodstream. So this is the treatment paradigm for stage four lung cancer back in 2015, only three short years or three and a half short years ago. If somebody was diagnosed with a cancer that started in the lungs and spread or learned how to spread to another part of the body, the treatments were chemotherapy, okay? And if the cancer progressed on this chemotherapy, the second option was chemotherapy as well. Now, can anyone raise their hand and name other types of treatments that we have available now in 2018? Targeted. So good, we have targeted treatments and immunotherapy. So what we've added in the last few years, and this is why this field has, has you know, exploded recently, and you know, why, again, why people are living longer with lung cancer and living better with lung cancer, is that we now have different treatment options for people who have stage four lung cancer. So we used to only have chemotherapy, and chemotherapy, again, is a critically important part of armamentarium. What it does is it kills cancer cells, but unfortunately can also kill normal cells, and, and hence some of the side effects that we discuss with you when we see in clinic. Whereas targeted therapy is really specific uh, to the, act the actual target in the lung cancer. So if someone has a targetable alteration, and anyone know any of them in the room? 
EGFR, ALK, ALK, BRAF, BRAF, and there's one other one that has an FDA approved drug. So T790, and that's a great point, we'll come back to that, that's a, a, a mutation that can happen after EGFR. The le- so KRAS is one that we don't have a great pill for or a great, you know, uh, um, a targetable uh, uh, mechanism for yet, but we are working on it. The other one is ROS1 or ROS1. And the reason why those four genes or four abnormalities in those, in those genes are so important is because if we identify them, then we can match the patient to a targeted therapy, an oral therapy. And I always tell my patients who I see, I want you to be on the best possible therapy for you. What does that mean? It means the one that's going to let you live the longest and have the least amount of side effects so that you can have good quality of life. And, and that's the goal. So we now, as standard of care, are looking for genetic abnormalities in each and every one of the patients that we see in our clinic. So I, I know I spoke to some of you in the room already, but it, it's so important that you talk to your docs and say, you know, what are my genetics or what are the genetic abnormalities in my cancer? So not all cancers have specific abnormalities that we can block, but we should look for them in everybody. So we talk... So it's a great, gamma knife is a a type of local treatment or radiation type treatment, not specific to any one cancer. So we talked about chemotherapy, we talked about targeted therapy, targeted therapy are pills, and we'll talk briefly about immunotherapy. Before that, you had a question. Yes, are you talking primarily about non-small cell? Yeah, so I am primarily talking about non-small cell. We can briefly talk about small cell as well, that's an important point. So we talked about tar- we talked about chemotherapy, we talked about targeted therapy, and the last one is immunotherapy. Does anyone know how immunotherapy works? Good. So, you know, there, there's a theory that we're all developing cancers in our body all the time. Uh, and it's nothing wrong with your immune system. Your immune system is working well. It's that your cancer sort of outsmarts your immune system, right? So it prevents it from recognizing it. So what immunotherapy is, and and the Nobel Prize was just awarded about two months ago now, or a month and a half ago now, the concept that can we get your immune system to rev up a little bit, to try to better understand and recognize the cancer. So immunotherapy actually does not kill cancer cells. And this is something that is is, important for people who are going through immunotherapy. It doesn't work quickly like chemotherapy does. It takes time for it to allow the immune system to rev up to then better recognize and attack the cancer. And interestingly, the side effects of immunotherapy are not the same as chemotherapy, right? It doesn't kill normal cells, so things like nausea, things like hair loss may not be seen with immunotherapy as they're seen in chemotherapy. What are the side effects of immunotherapy? So your immune system normally is not trying to recognize and attack its normal self, and that's why the cancers sort of slide under the door in a sense, and they're not being recognized by your immune system. But sometimes when we remove those sort of breaks on the immune system and let the immune system run wild to hopefully recognize and attack the cancer, sometimes it could recognize and attack our own normal self. And it can cause things like rash, it can cause things like diarrhea, it can cause things like shortness of breath. So it's very important that you talk to your doctors if you're having any new symptoms while receiving any ones of these, any kinds of these uh, therapies, immunotherapy. So back in 2015, this was what our treatment paradigm was for somebody who I would see in the office. And this is where we are in 2018. It's a lot more complex right, is a lot more going on. And again, this is a testament to all the science in the lab and all the clinical trials that are being done in our clinic space. So here's a a list of all the FDA-approved drugs for the treatment of lung cancer. And I I apologize if it's too small and you can't read it, but anyone recognize any of the names of the drugs on this board? Raise your hand if you received one of these drugs. Good. So we're, we're, we're doing more and more. And again, you know, if you look at this slide, these are the drugs that have been FDA approved in the last four to five years. Okay. So in 2012, we didn't have, you know, a lot of the targeted therapies. We had no immunotherapy approved. So look how far we've come. And this is a point that I always make with every single person who I meet in the clinic is there's a lot of hope. I want everyone in the room to know that we're doing a lot to study this disease. 
we're learning about new mechanisms, we're learning about resistance of mechanisms, and we're learning about you know, what different drugs we can offer to patients that will particularly help that individual person. So what are some of the trials that we're running here at NYU? And this is not an exhaustive list, but just one of the lists, and I wanna highlight one of the trials run by my colleague, Dr. Elaine Shum, uh, looking at immunotherapy in the early uh, sort of setting, in patients who have lung cancers that are stage one to stage three. So cancers that have not progressed through the body or not learned how to travel through the body, can we use immunotherapy there? And could you know that benefit people to live longer? So we talked a little bit about immunotherapy already, but I just want to make this a point that immunotherapy in the last two and a half years has become the standard treatment for all people with stage four lung cancer. And you made a good point. Are we talking about just non-small cell lung cancer, or are we talking also about small cell lung cancer? Does anyone know the difference between those two? Good, so one is more aggressive. Which one is more aggressive? Small cells are a little more aggressive, and it's seen exclusively in, in people who smoke, and non-small cell lung cancer. So these are different categories that explain sort of the biology or how the cells look under the microscope. Non-small cell lung cancer has multiple different subtypes of cancer. Does anyone know those? What's the most common type of non-small cell? So adenocarcinoma is the most common, and the second most common one here in the United States? Squamous cell cancer, exactly. So even in small cell, and in non-small cell, the standard of care in the first line setting now includes immunotherapy, okay? So chemotherapy is still important in the first line, but it should include immunotherapy for every single patient. So we're able to measure something now on the cancer cell called PDL1 or program death ligand one. And the way I think about that is sort of the cloak that sits on the cancer cell that disguises the immune system from recognizing the cancer cell. So if you have a high level of that cloak or disguise, there's a high likelihood that if you remove the cloak or you remove the disguise, the immune system will then be able to recognize and attack the cancer. And we can actually grade that. So we grade the PDL1 or the cloak or the disguise that's on the cancer cell. And if you have a high level of disguise, greater than 50%, we then recommend immunotherapy alone in non-small cell lung cancer. And if you have a, a low level of cloak or disguise, a PDL1 expression less than 50%, we're recommending chemotherapy and immunotherapy together. And that actually was done out of this institution here at NYU. Lena Gandhi published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, back in June of 2018, and that has now become the new standard of care. So again, to reiterate that point, June 2018, new standard of care. So things are rapidly evolving in this space. So again, moving back to this immunotherapy clinical trial, uh, Dr. Shum's trial, we're trying to understand, can we move the immunotherapy from the later stages, from stage four, to the earlier stages, patients who have early stage lung cancer, stage one, two, and three, and would that allow people to live longer? So in people who have lung cancer that is in the lung, and they're an operable candidate, meaning they can go to the operating room at some point, this study was done in a pilot in 22 people, and this is our sort of New England Journal of Medicine is our New York Times, right? This is the, the sort of premier uh, journal that we look at. And neoadjuvant just simply in English means to get immunotherapy or to get a treatment before surgery. Um, neoadjuvant PD-1, which we talked about, in this study they used a drug called nivolumab, which some of you may have heard, uh, in patients who have resectable lung cancers. And this is just showing one patient, right, who received two doses of immunotherapy before the surgery. Interestingly, before the surgery, here's the tumor on the scan. And four weeks later, th this study, people received two doses, and it was every two weeks. Um, two doses, the tumor is sort of, you know, almost gone. And when we look at it histologically, this almost looks like a normal specimen, whereas this looks like a cancer specimen. So it's, perhaps can we study this in, in people moving forward? Can we give a dose or two doses of immunotherapy before the operating room? And this is a study that is ongoing here, again, led by Dr. Shum, where when we meet a patient, we, we talk to them about the standard treatments. We offer them to see a surgeon. We offer chemotherapy, which is now standard of care. And then we also offer a clinical trial. Again, clinical trials are new opportunities to study new things that may ultimately help benefit that patient, but also patients in the future. 
where we offer two doses of this atezolizumab, which is another uh, um, uh, immunotherapy agent, followed by surgery. And then we're able to tell in the operating room whether the, the, the immunotherapy worked well in the patient. And if it did, and if there's no evidence of any cancer anymore in the surgery or after the surgery, we then offer the immunotherapy after surgery. If the immunotherapy does not work, which it doesn't in most people, we then would offer the standard types of treatments. So again, this is a concept of us looking at how can we move these drugs forward to better help our patients that we're seeing in clinic. I want to just go over two more clinical trials. Uh, you had mentioned the EGFR space, and you had talked about you know EGFR, or epidermal growth factor receptor, is a commonly mutated gene in folks who develop cancer. We see it in about 10% of the people, especially folks who were never smokers. Um, and if we identify that abnormality, we're able to match a patient to a targeted therapy or a pill. Has anyone heard of the pill or been on the pill? What's the name of the pill? Tegrisso, excellent. So Tegrisso, or osimertinib, is the FDA-approved first-line regimen, a first-line pill. And there's a really neat story here, because that's not the pill that was approved three years ago. That pill was only approved about a year ago. So what pill was approved three years ago is a different type of pill. So Tarceva, or Erlotinib, was approved three or four years ago for this specific cohort of, of patients. And the reason why we have a newer pill now is because we learned more about the biology. There was great science done in the laboratory to try to understand why people who received Tarceva, the initial pill that was approved, why did their cancers continue to grow over some time? Why did the, the, the pill or the cancer become resistant to the pill? And that's where we identified the T790M. That's a second resistance mechanism. So now Tegrisso is better, or we know is better than Tarceva, and people will all receive Tegrisso in the first-line setting in someone who is diagnosed with an EGFR-driven cancer. Now, even for Tegrisso, we do worry that resistance can occur over time. And when we do see resistance, we are now studying and better understanding the next line of resistance, and that's C797S, or something called MET amplification. And we just secured a study that just opened, actually, we put our first patient on at this institution last week on Thursday that is now looking to treat patients who have progression of their cancer after the osimertinib or Tegrisso. You had a question up there. Yeah, so T790M sounds like uh, Greek, right? What does that really mean? It just means that EGFR, it's the location, right? It's like, you know, 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue. The gene is sort of like the block of, uh, or the, 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 the cityscape of Manhattan. And it's where the abnormality happens. Does it happen on 1st Avenue, on 2nd Avenue, or 3rd Avenue, or Lex? And the abnormality, T790M, just so happens to cause the cancer to become resistant to the medication, the Tarceva. And now we're finding other mutations that happen on Lexington Avenue, for example, right, called the C797S. And if we're able to profile it or better understand it, right, then we're able to think about new mechanisms of resistance and new mechanisms of blocking that abnormality. So that will lead me into liquid biopsy, which is critically important and is a new, uh, a new sort of technology in the field of the treatment of lung cancer. So how do we identify genetic abnormalities in people who have cancer. What are some of the ways? So biomarkers, how do we detect the genetic abnormalities? What are we generally doing? Anyone who's diagnosed with a lung cancer is generally obtaining a biopsy, right? So when we get a biopsy, we get a piece of tissue that we then send to our colleagues in pathology who are able to look at it under the microscope and you know, tell us what type of lung cancer it is, whether it's non-small cell or small cell. And then they're actually able to do these tests that'll tell us what genes are abnormal, EGFR, ALK, and so on and so forth. Now, you can imagine that every time somebody progresses on a medication, or the medication, I should say, fails the person taking it, we would then go ahead and get a repeat biopsy of whatever area was growing to try to understand what abnormality was there, okay, or what resistance mechanism was there. Now, using liquid biopsy, we can actually draw blood or peripheral blood, just like you would get a regular blood draw, a blood count, or a chemistry, a kidney, or a liver panel, we can now draw a regular blood test. It's a lot more expensive, right? But we can draw a regular blood test that they will then sequence and try to identify what abnormalities are in your cancer, right? Because we know that there are circulating cancer cells 
that have cancer cells, but also cancer DNA in the peripheral blood. So here's just a quick schematic. This is tumor cells, uh, or a tumor, and the tumor sheds different proteins or DNA, and DNA is sort of the code, right, that allow the, or tell the, 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 the cancer to grow, whatever abnormalities are in that DNA. And by putting a needle into the vein, right, yes, you do get normal blood, but you're also able to detect some of these abnormalities or some of these abnormal uh, um, DNA signals. And there are many, many companies that are available now that are doing this. Um, we have our own assay internally. Uh, it's called the uh, 580 gene panel, which we do on tissue, and we're working on building one on liquid, you know, plasma as well. And this is sort of the future. And you know, please talk to your doctors about this, especially if you have a cancer that is driven by one genetic abnormality or one gene. So this is a small uh, prospective study that we did, looking at 200 patients at at the time of diagnosis could we identify a genetic abnormality in the blood, and would that change their ultimate care? So this is a map of all the genetic abnormalities that we identified in all 200 patients who were newly diagnosed with stage four lung cancer who walked into the clinic. And you can see TP53 was the largest number of, of uh, um, patients that we identified this in, and that's actually the most commonly altered gene in all cancers. We also identified ROS1, which we talked briefly about already. We identified a few patients with ALK, and we did identify patients with EGFR as well and a smattering of others. So we have four genetic abnormalities that we have FDA-approved match therapies for, but there are about 11 other abnormalities that we have clinical trials for. And we just brought over a trial uh, for a genetic abnormality called RET, or R-E-T, which is very rare, but that is a potential opportunity. Uh, and, and it's important to note that you do want to go to a center where they do have targeted therapies or targeted treatments specific to the patient. So when we look at all 200 people who we identified, what were we, what were we able to do? Or what was the outcome of those people? So 23% of the patients, so out of 200, 23% of them were matched to targeted therapy. And here's a list of all the targeted therapies that they were matched to. And there was a 97% response rate, meaning 97% of people had evidence of disease that became smaller or shrunk on the scan. This is a phenomenal number. With chemotherapy or even immunotherapy, the response rates are in the 40 to 50% range. With targeted therapy, we're able to get those response rates into the 70 and 80% range. And that's why this is so critical to identify this in all patients. Another thing that we compared is we looked at the time it took to identify an alteration in the tissue, okay? And on average, it took about 21 days versus about nine days where it took us to identify the abnormality in the plasma. And time matters. When you meet a patient in clinic who is symptomatic, who has shortness of breath or cough, time matters. If I can know that somebody has a genetic abnormality here versus here, they can be on the treatment for this amount of period of time. And that also prevents me from starting the essentially, not wrong treatment, but the chemotherapy or the broader treatment as opposed to the targeted treatment. So I want to thank the group. We have a very large group of folks here, and you maybe could pick out the docs who see you. This is the medical oncology team here. This is the surgical team, uh, the interventional pulmonologist, and also the radiation oncologist. And happy to take any questions.